CJ Dubois is Senior Technical Service and Development Scientist at Dow, where he focuses on lab to commercial scale blending of polymer modified asphalt. He previously worked in application development for DuPont and EI DuPont Demore. He holds 22 patents and is active in the Association of Modified Asphalt Producers, among other groups. CJ Dubois to talk about modifiers. Good afternoon, everyone. As was mentioned, uh, today I'll be given an overview of some of the various polymer modifiers that are used in uh, pavement preservation applications. You know, Chris covered a little bit about, you know, asphalt. Um, I'll do a little bit deeper dive. Basically, if we baseline the discussion, you know, asphalt's complicated. You know, it, it, it's not a single um, chemical. You know, we heard, you know, from emulsion standpoint, you've got water. It's a single chemical, surfactants. Etc. It's a continuum. It has many different individual compounds in itself. They all have individual chemical structures. Most of it's hydrogen carbon atoms. Uh, there is a sprinkling of hetero atoms, so oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. They're there at low percentages. These are important because they add polarity to the, to the system, and they're potentially reactive sites. Also, there's some trace metals you know, that can do some chemistry. Uh, often these are used for fingerprinting, you know, all of these various ratios of the structural components, they're all different based on where the crude oil came from and then how the refinery processed the material. You know, asphalt chemistry itself is gonna impact the modification. Uh, you're gonna choose the right one for the job. Uh, you know, there's always a lot of different classifications for, for making that decision, you know, hard to solve. You know, if we think about penetration grading, you know, low, high viscosity, if we think about AC grading, you know, there's performance grading, you know, softer binders like a 52 up to the harder binders like a 64. And all of the basic properties we're interested in impact pollen modification and then vice versa. I'll warn everyone there is going to be some chemical structures here. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to keep everyone on their toes. But, you know, if we dive deeper into the structural impacts of the asphalt, you know, it, there's the classic maltine asphaltine model. There's four major components, saturates, aromatics, uh, resins, and asphaltines. But these are artificial from the standpoint is for, that they're derived based on solvent fractionation. So the solubility of each of these components relative to each other, and then in different solvents such as heptane, aromatics like toluene, chlorinated solvents. From top to bottom, you know, these are going to range from left to more hetero atoms, and then the structure gets more complex. Saturates are the most nonpolar. Um, if we look at the ratios of, of carbon uh, and hydrogen, uh, there are approximately two. Um, there, there, is, there could be some cyclic structure, generally not. You know, they're all going to be sort of you know branched, you know, aliphatic chain type structures. These are all in heptane soluble. Um, they're the lightest molecular weight of all of the four components. Moving next into aromatics, these now are starting to build up some structure. They, they're, there's more cyclic. As a result, the amount of hydrogen drops. So the hydrogen to carbon ratio, you know, now has moved from two to around 1.5. Uh, we're building up some molecular weight, you know, as the structure increases. Um, these are around 10% higher on average molecular weight than a, a, like a, the saturates. Now we're moving into seeing more solvent solubility. And then next, we move down to higher molecular weight in the resin. Now we're building in polarity, uh, you know, sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen. Um, uh, heteroatoms are now becoming more and more prevalent. Significant bump in molecular weight. Uh, hydrogen carbon ratio is very similar around 1.5, you, you know, because it's got a combination of aliphatic, you know, alkyl chain and these cyclic structures. Uh, broader solubility. And then we move into the heavy hitter in asphaltines, which is, is becoming super cyclic, more air, full aromatic character. Um, often you can think of these maybe as like, quote, chicken wire, uh, just be, because of, of, of how everything's starting to become fused together. The, the double bond character can range, you know, a little bit broader. Um, these now, are, you know, starting to have challenges from a solubility standpoint in solvents. Uh, you're going to need aromatic or chlorinated solvents, and sometimes even those won't solubilize some of the larger structures. You know, compared to the saturates, you know, we may be anywhere from 50% to four times larger, you know, from a molecular weight standpoint. 
a lot of the heavier items now, depending on the crude source and then if the refining started to cleaving a lot of these side chains, these are going to be important from a polymer modification standpoint because certain polymers actually to react directly with the asphalt, uh, you know, component itself. From a continuum model, the malting phases serve uh, to solubilize the asphalt teams, keep everything in the solid in a single phase. And this is really critical because, as I said, you know, the, all of these have a wide range of molecular weight. The, the putting them in four different buckets, you know, isn't quite right, but we've had to develop the model based on, you know, the industry based on doing our best. Some of these may even just be subtle differences between, between these, especially with, say, less treated, lighter crudes, you know, where, where you may not have as many asphalt teams, you know, you, you have more resins, for example. Why modify with, with polymers? You know, the key is we want it to, to improve the useful temperature interval over an unmodified. Uh, and, and by that, we mean we're, we're interested in high, intermediate, and low temperature and performance Im improvement. Now, when we think about permanent deformation at high temperature or, you know, you know, that often is, is, that's a creep failure. So when rutting happens, you know, you've got flow and there, there's no elasticity, permanent deformation. Also, polymers can help mitigate bleeding flushing. You know, from an intermediate temperature perspective, you know, we, we, see, we can see improvements with fatigue resistance. And then on the low temperature side, where we always worry so much about cracking, the TG of the polymer can help the TG of, of the asphalt itself. That can maintain flexibility to offer that low temperature cracking resistance. You know, at the end of the day, holistically, we're increasing the cost of the system by adding polymers. The payoff is we reduce the life cycle cost overall, making it less expensive because now we've got a higher performing system. Later, what I'll do is I'm gonna review a, a wide variety of polymer chemistries, kind of compare and contrast the differences between the, the, the various classes. You know, the key throughout here is that the asphalt chemistry is going hand in hand with, with the polymer chemistry. So picking the right one for your project application is really key. But they're both linked and so differences in say a bitumen is could impact the performance of the polymer you're choosing. You know, choosing, there may be a better choice for, for a polymer based on the bitumen like you're locked into for your project. So I've got quotes here for best, but there's the devil's in the details and, and it's really going to depend on what you want to do for that specific project, uh, you know, you're picking and choosing uh, materials for. What exactly is a polymer? Uh, you know, simply it, it, it's just, it's a high molecular weight, you know, chemical compound consisting of smaller repeat units. Um, these are, you know, monomers or, or MERS. If you look in the upper right, this is an example of polyethylene. Uh, you know, it's a simple polymer, all carbon hydrogen. You know, earlier we were talking about hydrogen to carbon ratios in the bitumen component. Here, polyethylene would have a two to one because it's all saturated. One carbon for every two hydrogens. You know, because of this, we can start building up complexity. And so a polymer chemist can start throwing in other monomers. And so if we have two or more types, that's a copolymer. And of course, you know, polymer chemists have to make it complicated and a copolymer can actually have three or four or five or however many monomers you want in it, just as long as it's got two or more. And then we can call that a terpolymer for three monomers, you know, et cetera. Polymer chemist has many different ways to prepare polymers. And that's gonna really depend on the choice of the monomer the molecular architecture you want to tailor. So if you've got co-monomers, co the ratios relative to each other or amounts, you know, how big of a molecular weight do you want to build up? Does your application need something small, medium, or large? You can control, and, and I'll go into this in the next slide, is like branching. It is, so these aren't often just pure linear thinking about spaghetti strands. You can have branching. You can choose the polymerization method that, that, and that controls molecular weight. But basically, you can custom tailor really almost anything under the sun to get what you want. Here, just as an example, just to pick on polyethylene, um, this is a transmission electron micrograph of 0 0.920 gram per cubic centimeter ethylene octane copolymer. This was custom, used a special single site catalyst. What you see is what looks kind of like worms are individual polymer strands. And so you can tailor that architecture in the, you know, the backbone and you can change the density. And, and for polyethylene, you know, that's where we get high density and low density materials. And because you've tailored everything, you get very specific properties that are key to the application, you know, you're wanting to use the material in. 
you know, the same things here in asphalt. You know, we choose a polymer that's just right for what we want to, you know, formulate and, and uh, for whether it's hot mix or emulsion. Like I said, there's really everything under the sun when it comes to how you want to connect things. Um, if we think of just homopolymers, you know, polyethylene again, the density is important because it tailors the properties. And where that comes from is, is, is branching. And branching is key for a lot of different applications. And, and so with here, this would be a number four plastic, you know, linear low density polyethylene. You've got these short chain branches that are regularly spaced. Uh, these are very kind of more of them than say high density, which has the same architecture. And then low density is simply fewer branches, but they're longer. And what this means is that high density polyethylene is used in rigid applications because it packs really tight together and it's more crystalline. And that gives you, you know, important properties you would want, say, in your orange juice jug, you know, or your milk jug or, or something else where it's a rigid tight bottle. Low density is often used in film applications. So food packaging and things like that, this would be, this would be number two, this would be number four plastic as an example. And, and, and so because of that, you know, you wouldn't pick an, a high density for like a high clarity food packaging application because the film's cloudy. Where low density, because it's more spaced out, more amorphous, less crystallinity, you know, you get that high clarity that you want to see like, you know, your steak that you're getting from the supermarket. If we start thinking about copolymers, which, you know, really is what we really use in asphalt mods, styrene butadiene, like a, a block like this, probably something we're more familiar with. We'll go into more detail later, but having this block structure is really important for elastomeric properties. And then other polymers you may be more familiar with are polyamines or nylon or your polyester, like would be in your water or soda bottle. Um, those are perfectly alternating because they're copolymers that only react with the other monomer, not itself. And so you get this sort of perfectly alternating AB, AB, AB repeat, and that has important properties. Something probably we're most familiar with would be a pseudo-random or random polymer like in ethylene vinyl acetate, so EVA. Probably another thing to think about is you can do chemistry after you've made your polymer. And so grafted materials are often used in high, you know, high applications. So high impact polystyrene, what, where you have a polymer, and then you do something on it post polymerization to put another completely different type of uh, chemistry in. Stars are important when we think about it. You know, radial SBS is an example where you've got a core and then these arms, and then here this would be an example of a block uh, structure here. Also, if you do chemistry after you've incorporated in the asphalt, what you're really making is a thermoset. You know, lightly cross-linking will give something that's an irreversible nature compared to a thermoplastic like a polyethylene where it can disentangle afterwards. So, you know, here we have an epoxy resin example, but if you sulfur cross-linked SBS, you know, you're effectively making a, a light thermoset that's still processable. Two buckets to think about from polymers, uh, plastomers. Uh, you know, these are typically uh, things that can be shaped or molded at elevated temperature. They will have some elastomeric properties, uh, and that's really going to depend on the comonomer and, and, and how it's polymerized. EVA will be the example we go into a little bit deeper later. Uh, you know, I think we're most familiar from an elastomeric model where, you know, they're viscoelastic. Uh, these are natural rubber, the styrenics, SBS, SBR, RET, crumb rubber. Um, we won't talk about the crumb rubber today, but, you know, these materials at different temperatures are going to have different viscous and elastic behavior, which is really critical and why, you know, they're used so often. Real quick to cover plastomers and, and, and ethylene vinyl acetate. I mentioned that it's roughly random. And the reason why you would get a random copolymer having two monomers is, you know, so, so you take ethylene, the E, and vinyl acetate, the VA, to get EVA. There's four different ways that these materials can react. Ethylene can react with itself. Vinyl acetate can react with itself. Ethylene can react with the VA. And then the VA can react with the ethylene. And all of those have what's called a different reactivity ratio, which is just simply like how likely is it to react with itself. You know, you can get really fancy if you're a polymer chemist. You know, you can have, you know, things that are make perfectly alternating copolymers because they don't react with itself. Uh, others, like in this case, are more random. Uh, there is some blocky character here, which really, which that, along with the polarity of the VA, impacts in, in, and kind of boosts its elasticity, you know, over, say, polyethylene, which really would, would not contribute because it's just, it's a homopolymer.
Uh, you can control the, the ethylene vi vinyl acetate ratio. That imparts different properties. You can control the molecular weight. The VA is really critical here because it helps, you know, by adding the polarity, it enhances its solubility in, in the bitumen over, over just a pure polyethylene. The ethylene-rich segments form crystalline regions. The VA segments are more amorphous. That kind of hard soft block, which I'll, I'm going to talk to about later in the last room session or section, really is, is sort of like kind of is, it is why it's better than say ethylene if you wanted to introduce a little bit of, of elasticity. To go through the, the elastomers real quick, you know, we're going to talk about food. So, you know, I mentioned the hard and soft segments and, and how those are required for, from a, from a, to, to be really considered an elastomer. Um, if we think about the spaghetti and meatballs model, you know, the spaghetti is going to be the backbone that allows stress to be dissipated. Um, the meatballs are where everything crosslinks, and you really need those crosslinks because that's going to mitigate permanent deformation. So while the spaghetti is flexible and can flow, it can rebound after stress and dissipate it, the meatballs link everything together. And without it, you know, you'll just get permanent flow. This has implications, you know, from all of the things we want. You know, so from a high temperature standpoint, having cross-linking and elastomeric behavior is going to mitigate rutting. It's going to increase softening point. It's going to de decrease pen. From a low temperature standpoint, it's, you're going to keep flexibility at low temperature over, say, an unmodified asphalt. And because we're enhancing the viscosity, because now we've got a, a, a polymer modifier that's cross-linked, that's going to enhance adhesion. And so what that means is that's going to have a thicker you know, film on the aggregate, which is you know, important. And also, this can help reduce aging. Now, the first real elastomer was natural rubber. Uh, you know, it's, it's based on isoprene uh, repeat units, which would be the structure here. It's a cis-1-4 connection. So that's a fancy way to say this is carbon-1, this is carbon-4, and then the connection is on the same side of the double bond. And, and that's really important when it comes to the physical properties. And uh, natural rubber is mostly cis-1-4. Synthetic rubber is going to have uh, potentially four possible connectivities with the base monomer. This is a fairly high molecular weight material, you know, 1 million grams per mole. Um, it's going to have a broad molecular weight distribution, which is important because it means that, you know, every polymer chain link is a different length, and it's going to be a lot of different links together, where others, if you, you know, that we'll talk later, like with SBS, has a narrow molecular weight. That impacts the properties because most of the polymers are the same length, you know, if you line them up. Talking about the, the two styrenics cases, if we look at SBR, it's going to be roughly random copolymer. It's about 25% styrene, about 75% butadiene. Um, you know, here's a styrene molecule, here's a butadiene, and this is where they would be linked. Again, the styrene's a hard segment, the butadiene's a soft segment. This is going to impart elasticity, uh, like we talked about in our food model. Uh, this is going to be a similar molecular weight to the natural rubber, around a million. That means there's probably 2,500 styrene monomers and around 14,000 butadiene to get the material that we're familiar with. Now, if we look at uh, you know, SBS, it's completely different, even though it takes the same basic building blocks, styrene, you know, butadiene. Here, we've got, say, a tri-block. So you have a whole run length of styrene, a whole run length of the butadiene, and then another length, whole run length of the styrene. This is about a 30-70 ratio, so not too far off from the SBR, but it's a completely different polymerization method. And, and the, you know, that's a, you know, it's a very sophisticated method compared to, to just random polymerization because there's a lot of tailoring it takes to run into to make these blocks. Again, now we've got real formal hard segments in the styrene formal soft segments in the butadiene. That is going to, that's why we have very, very high elasticity with SBS. Uh, and that's over the fact that we're probably 10% the molecular weight of say SBR or natural rubber, you know, 100,000 molecular weight. And what this means is there's about 300 styrene units, about 1,200, 1,250 butadiene units. Even though we've cut by, you know, 90% the molecular weight, it can have higher elasticity, especially in that it's often sulfur crosslinked to make that boost by, by, by making a processable thermoset. The last polymer I'll talk about as we wrap up would be, you know, RET, you know, reactive elastomeric tur polymer. Um, this is completely different than really all of the systems we've talked about. It, it's a polyethylene system, so it's kind of like 
you know, you know, some of the ethylene copolymers will typically have is, you know, ethylene. Um, it'll have an aliphatic acrylate. In this case, there's a four carbon, so a butyl. And then there, there'll be an epoxy functionalized, in this case, glycyl methacrylate. There's a wide number of, of monomers out there. Um, you know, you can have methyl acrylate, you know, meth, uh, you know, different types of these glycylside groups. What, what, what's different about this is this imparts reactivity directly with the asphalt. And so your hard soft segments are created, maintain high elasticity. These are going to have lower molecular weight than some of the other materials. So low shear processing often is enough. When we mentioned sulfur cross-linking when the SBS case, these are often PPA cross-linked. And so here PPA would be a co-reactant because it's consumed, you know, not a modifier where we're often seeing, you know, PPA added, you know, on its own. And just to highlight, you know, kind of why these are a little bit different is we, we mentioned heteroatoms earlier and you know sulfur nitrogen oxygen and, and where they have these uh, hydrogen bonds to the heteroatom is, is where this epoxide would be reactive to and so you can heat cross-link these which is the slower process or use your co-reactant to accelerate it and what can be seen in the lab is, is if you start looking at this you know that that cross-linking can happen in a matter of minutes here just uh looking at you know, grade bumping after addition of the cross linker, you know, it's, it's done in a couple of minutes in the lab. And you can see that both from the continuous grade improvement and then how much the phase angle drops from the 80s down into the 60s. So I'll stop there. You know, thanks for your attention and, and appreciate also the organizers and what it takes for them to, to get all the cats herded today and, and, and uh, the invitation. So thank you. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.